today, in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to be speaking to you about Jehovah's Witnesses and the way that evangelical Christians can speak to Jehovah's Witnesses. Let me tell you why I do what I do. I love Jehovah's Witnesses. I love Mormons. I love New Agers. I love cultists. This is the motivation. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. That's the motivation for everything that I do. And I would like to encourage you that that should be your mindset as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot more to Christianity than having the right answer. There's a lot more to apologetics than just knowing about the attributes of Jesus Christ. We also need to have the attitude of Jesus Christ in reaching out to people. And I'm talking about love and compassion. And so that's one of the things that I just really want to drive home to you. A lot of times people don't care so much what you say until they can see that love in you and see that you can genuinely care for them. And that's the motivation for why I do what I do. I have a genuine care and concern. Now at the same time, I do like to share some specific things with Jehovah's Witnesses and I'd like to share some of those things with you. But no matter what I say to you in the next 40 minutes or so, the thing that underlines all of it is the spirit of love and compassion. Okay? And when I'm talking to Jehovah's Witnesses, one of the first things I like to do is to talk about the Watchtower Society. The issue is this. The track record of the Watchtower Society's prophecies is not such that I personally would want to entrust my eternal salvation to it. That's not to say that there aren't some nice people there. I'm just saying that if there's an organization that has been consistently wrong in a lot of the prophecies that it set forth, do you want to, e to really entrust your eternal salvation to that organization? And this is one of the points that I like to bring up. Now, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but let me just give you a couple of main points. Uh, first of all, uh, it is true that the Watchtower Society has claimed to be God's prophet. Uh, today, the Watchtower Society often says that they're just interpreters of God's prophecies and not really a prophet. But in the past, it is very clear that the Watchtower has claimed to be a prophet and to be the spokesman for Jehovah. And if that's true, then there should be no falsity coming from the Watchtower Society. In fact, the Watchtower Society has been called God's prophet-like organization. Uh, and in fact, let me just read you a few quotes from past issues of the Watchtower magazine. Uh, and by the way, I do read all of these. I do read books by Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and New Agers. I might mention to you that my wife Carrie makes me read two Christian books for every book by Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. It's like a, a standing rule that she's come up with in our house. So I'm obe obedient to that. Uh, in any event, in event uh, the Watchtower says this. Is not the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society the one and only channel which the Lord has used in dispensing the truth continually since the beginning of the harvest period? Here's another statement. The Watchtower says that we must recognize not only Jehovah God as our Father, but his organization as our mother. The Watchtower tells us, unless we are in touch with this channel of communication that God is using, the Watchtower, we will not progress along the road to life. So I think it's real clear that the Watchtower in the past has made claims to being a prophet. And the thing that concerns me is that there have been a number of false prophecies set forth by this organization. I'd like to just give you a couple examples, if I could. Uh, in 1914, it was prophesied that the uh, Lord Jesus would come again invisibly and that God would set up his kingdom. In fact, Watchtower literature said that God would certainly set up his kingdom on planet Earth by the year 1914. And in fact, Charles Taze Russell made this statement. He said that within the coming 26 years, all present governments will be overthrown and dissolved. The full establishment of the kingdom of God will be accomplished by 1914. Now, it didn't happen. I do not say this because I delight in saying it. In fact, I have some friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, it, it brings me grief to have to point out these kind of things, but because I care for the Jehovah's Witness, I do point out these things. This is an organization that promised something that was going to happen in 1914, and it didn't happen. 
do you want to trust your eternal salvation to an organization that claims to be a prophet and yet has been wrong like this? Uh, back in 1925, we see that another prophecy was set forth. And this was a prophecy involving the coming again of the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were supposed to come in 1925 and live in a estate in San Diego called Beth Sharim. Now, you've got numerous prophecies in Watchtower publications that this was certainly going to happen. For example, one publication said, We may expect 1925 to witness the return of these faithful men of Israel from the condition of death, being resurrected in 1925, and this will mark the return of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the faithful prophets of old. Now, you've got a 1917 issue of the Watchtower reiterating this fact. Then you've got a 1923 issue of the Watchtower magazine reiterating this fact that, that uh, in fact, these patriarchs will come again in 1925. A 1924 issue said that the year 1925 is a date definitely and clearly marked in the scriptures. Well, the patriarchs never showed up. And many Jehovah's Witnesses were extremely distraught because of that. Now again, I don't take delight in pointing this out to a Jehovah's Witness. I care about Jehovah's Witnesses. I genuinely do. But I care even more for their salvation. And that's why I share some of this. Uh, Do you want to entrust your soul to the teachings of an organization that has been consistently wrong in the way that the Watchtower has? Now there's other examples that I could mention, but for time's sake, I'm going to move on. Uh, I see that uh, time is just flying by rapidly. I guess time flies when you have fun, right? Let me move on to my second major point. And this has to do with demonstrating not just what you believe, but why you believe it. We have a lot of Christians today who understand what they believe, but they don't necessarily know why they believe it. And I don't think it should be that way. Uh, I believe that you should be able to establish why you believe that Jesus is God. Christians ought to be able to establish why they believe in a triune God. Christians should be able to establish why they believe that salvation is by faith in Christ. These are the kinds of things that I like to share with the Jehovah's Witness. And again, uh, as you're talking with the Jehovah's Witness, one of the things that's going to come up is problem passages. I think you would agree with me that there are certain verses in Scripture that are a little bit difficult to understand. And the problem is, is that sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will bring up verses that seem to indicate that Jesus is a lesser God than God the Father. And what I like to do in a loving and compassionate way is to sit down with them and just look at one verse at a time. And let me exhort you as Christians to be sure not to get into some kind of an argument or condescend and make like you've got a spiritual chip on your shoulder. You need to act from a position of compassion, just like Christ does. Even when you're talking about verses from the Bible that you disagree with their interpretation of, you need to be compassionate in how you handle that. Now, I'd like to briefly look at six representative verses, and we may not get through all six. It just depends on how fast we go here. But the first one is in John 3.16. Let me read it to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Well, some translations put it this way. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Well, if Jesus is only begotten, the Jehovah's Witnesses reason that Jesus must have come into being at a point in time. Jesus must not be eternal. Well, evangelical Christians don't see it that way. They interpret this verse differently. And they interpret this verse in such a way that still recognizes that Jesus is eternal God. Yes, there was a time when Jesus became a man 2,000 years ago, but nevertheless, Jesus is eternal God. Now, we as uh, evangelical Christians believe that when Jesus claimed to be the Son of God before his Jewish contemporaries, what did they do? How did they respond? They picked up stones to stone him. And the reason they did that was because they understood him to be claiming to be God. Now keep in mind that when they picked up stones to stone him, Jesus didn't say, Oh no, you've got it all wrong. I wasn't claiming to be God. 
Jesus let his meaning stand because, in fact, he was claiming to be God. And, in fact, among the ancient Jews, uh, eternal sonship, or this idea that Christ is the Son of God, communicates that Jesus has the same nature as the Father does. It's a divine nature. Now, what kind of nature do I, as a human being, pass on to my son? It's a human nature. Well, just as the Father has a divine nature, so the Son of God, Christ, also has a divine nature. And that's what we as evangelical Christians believe. Now, I could spend the next hour talking about evidence for the fact that Christ was the Son of God before he was incarnate, before he came to planet Earth. Uh, For example, we could talk about the fact that in Hebrews 2, it says that God created the universe through his Son. Jesus was the Son of God before the creation even began. Or we could look at Colossians 1.17, where Christ as the Son is said to have existed before all things. Or we could look at John 8, verses 54 to 56, where it indicates that Jesus, speaking as the Son of God, asserts his eternal pre-existence before the person of Abraham. Clearly, Christ was the Son of God before the Incarnation. Uh, I, I want to stress to you that the fact that Christ is the Son of God does not mean he was a created being. That's just not what the text says. Now, there's another verse that often comes up, and that is John 14, 28. The verse reads this way. If you say that you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I am. Well, there's the point. If the Father is greater than Jesus, doesn't that indicate that the Father is a greater God than Jesus? This is what the Jehovah's Witnesses argue. But we as evangelical Christians don't see it that way. You have to understand that when Jesus talked about the Father being greater, he was using a word that indicates position. The Father is positionally greater than I am. Now keep in mind, Jesus was on the earth at this point. He was being persecuted by the Jews. Uh, They were trying to stone him to death. He was about to be crucified. He had been born in a lowly manger. Meanwhile, the Father is up in heaven, seated on his throne of highest glory. Angels surrounding the throne, singing praises to his name, singing holy, holy, holy. Positionally speaking, it's very clear that the Father is greater than Jesus. But Jesus is still eternal God. In the incarnation, Jesus, as eternal God, stepped out of heaven and into the womb of Mary and was born as a man. But he still retained his divine nature. So when Jesus said, the Father is greater than I am, Jesus was not saying that he was a lesser God than God the Father. You need to be able to demonstrate this to your Jehovah's Witness friends. There's a third verse, Colossians 1.15. And in this verse, it talks about Christ being the firstborn. Now, obviously, if Christ is firstborn, we are told, this must mean that Christ was created. He must be the first one created by Jehovah. And indeed, this is what our Jehovah's Witness friends tell us. But we as evangelical Christians don't see it that way. In fact, our feeling is that if you're going to try to interpret words like firstborn, you ought to go to the scriptures to find out what those words mean. And we believe that when you go to scripture, you find that the word firstborn carries the idea of first in rank or preeminent. For example, back in Psalm 89, we are told that David is first in rank or preeminent. He's called the firstborn. But wait a minute. Wasn't David the last one born in his family? David was the last born son of Jesse, but he's nevertheless called the firstborn son. Why is that? Well, he's called the firstborn son because he is the preeminent one in his family. He became the king of Israel. And in the same way, when Jesus is called the firstborn of creation, that doesn't mean that he was the first one born in creation. Rather, what it means is that Christ is preeminent over the creation. And in fact, if you go to the very next verse, in verse 16, we are told why he is preeminent over creation, because he created the creation. Does it make sense to you that he who created the creation would be preeminent over the creation? Does it? I think it's good logic. And that's what we see taking place here in Colossians 1.15. Now, there's yet another verse, and that's Revelation 3.14. Uh, In Revelation 3.14, the Watchtower translation of this uh, verse, the New World Translation, translates it as Jesus being the beginning of God's creation. 
Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. Well, we as evangelical Christians believe that that's not the correct translation here. It is true that the word can be translated as beginning. It's the Greek word arche, A-R-C-H-E. Keep that in mind, because I'm going to bring it up later. The word also can be translated with a more important meaning as one who begins, the originator, the one who starts. And we Christians believe that when it says in uh, Revelation 3.14 that Jesus is the beginner of God's creation, that's pointing to Christ as the creator. And certainly this is in keeping with the other verses that we read in the New Testament, like Colossians 1.16, John 1.3, Hebrews 1.2, and other verses that talk about Christ as the divine creator. And in uh, Revelation 3.14, Christ himself is portrayed as the beginner. He is the arche of God's creation. And let me tell you something. We get the, the word architect from that Greek word. Christ is the architect of God's creation. That's what the scriptures indicate to us. He is the one who put it into being. Now, let me emphasize to you that that's not to say that the Father was not involved. Certainly he was. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we are told that the creation is from the Father, but through the Son. The Father is apparently the ultimate source, but it was carried out through the Son, Jesus Christ. That's what Revelation 3.14 is talking about. Well, the fifth verse, we're flying along, aren't we? 1 Corinthians 11.3, and I think this will be the final verse I'll look at. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says this, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Well, it's reasoned by Jehovah's Witness that if God the Father is the head of Christ, then Christ must not be God in the same way that the Father is. But evangelical Christians don't see it that way. We believe that this verse still indicates that Christ is absolutely divine. He is absolute deity. The reason it goes this way. Let's look at the example of men and women. Now, I don't want to get into feminist theology this morning. But let me just point out that men and women, biblically speaking, are perfectly equal in their nature. Would you agree with me? Men and women are perfectly equal in their nature. They're both human. They're both created in the image of God. They're positionally equal before God, according to uh, uh, Galatians 3.28. Yet nevertheless, there's a functional hierarchy that exists between them, with the man over the woman. The man is in authority over the woman. They are equal in nature, yet there is an authority structure there between the man and the woman. Well, the same thing is true in the Trinity. You see, Jesus and the Father are perfectly equal in their divine nature. But nevertheless, there is an authority structure there with the Father over the Son. So this verse does not indicate in any way that Jesus is a lesser God than God the Father, as the Jehovah's Witnesses argue. Rather, Jesus is perfectly equal to the Father in terms of his divine nature, but he is in submission to the Father in terms of the Father's authority. There is an authority structure there. So again, you as a Christian need to be able to demonstrate not just what you believe, but you must be able to demonstrate why you believe it as well. And when you're talking to your Jehovah's Witness friends, sit down over tea, invite them into your house, get to know them, make friends with them, open up your Bible to these verses one at a time, and just talk about them. Don't let the thing deteriorate into some kind of a hostile debate. Make a friend. My wife Carrie has made friends with two Jehovah's Witness women who, gosh, I guess they've come to our house for a couple of years. And they love each other. That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. I had a friend come over about every two weeks. His name was Lou. He was a Jehovah's Witness. He must have come over every two weeks uh, for at least a year. Uh, And during that time, we had very, very friendly discussions. I've always found most Jehovah's Witnesses to be very courteous when talking to me. So you shouldn't be fearful of that. Make a friend. Sit down and go over some of these problem passages. And I think that your discussions will be very, very fruitful. Now, what I'd like to do is to move on to the next section of my talk and emphasize that you also need to be able to set forth a positive defense for the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, this is one of my favorite topics. And in fact, if you look at some of my books, many of my books deal with Jesus Christ. You need to be able to set forth a positive defense of the deity of Christ. 
not just emphasizing what you believe, but why you believe it. In other words, you need to be able to point to specific verses in Scripture that indicate that Christ really is God. And if you can show a Jehovah's Witness some of these kinds of truths, then you might be able to introduce them to the beloved Savior. And that's my goal. Let me tell you something, folks. My goal is not to win an argument. My goal is to introduce people to the beloved Savior. You see, there are eternal souls at stake. There are eternal souls at stake in this, this issue. That's what motivates me. That's what drives me. I don't care about winning arguments. I care about sharing the Savior. But in the process of sharing the Savior, we need to go to the Scriptures, demonstrating not just what we believe, but why we believe it. Now let me just tell you my approach. I like to use both the Old Testament and the New Testament together as a way of demonstrating that Jesus is God. And here's how I do it. I will take Old Testament verses that talk about Yahweh, and then I will look at New Testament verses that talk about Jesus and draw a connection between them. And by using this kind of a method, you can show that Jesus is God. Now let me just give you a brief illustration to give you a handle on what I'm going to say for the rest of the morning. You might compare the Old Testament to a richly furnished but dimly lit room. A richly furnished but dimly lit room. I mean, there's all kinds of incredible furniture in this room, unlike my room. There's all kinds of incredible furniture in this room, like a mahogany table, a plush leather couch, and just all kinds of other neat stuff. But the lights are so dim that you can't see this incredible furniture. Now what happens when you go up and you start to turn up the lights on the wall? You start to turn up those lights, you start to see things in that room you never saw before. By turning up those lights, you're not bringing into that room anything that was not there before. You're just turning up the lights so you can see it better. Well, what we as Christians need to do is to approach the Old Testament from the greater light of the New Testament. And as we shine the greater light of the New Testament on the Old Testament, we start to see things that we never saw before. And by using this kind of an approach, you can start to see evidences for the deity of Christ. Can I give you some examples? Well, I'm going to give them to you anyway. I'm going to begin with the idea that Christ is the Creator. The idea that Christ is the Creator. Now, we're going to start back in the Old Testament. If we go back to Genesis, we see that God is the Creator. But there's another verse that I consider just really important, and that's Isaiah 44, 24. Isaiah 44, 24. In this verse, we read the following words. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, says. And I'm inserting Yahweh there. Your English translation says Lord, but Yahweh is the word behind it. This is what the Lord, Yahweh, says. I am the Lord, Yahweh, who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. Now that's pretty emphatic, isn't it? According to this verse, who is the creator? Yahweh. Is there any other creator besides Yahweh? Anybody that claims to be creator besides Yahweh would be a false prophet or a false god, wouldn't they? But Yahweh is the only creator. Now, the reason why that's significant is that when you get to the New Testament, we are told over and over again that Christ is the agent of creation. We see this in Colossians 1.16, John 1.3, Hebrews 1, 2, Revelation 3, 14, and other passages as well. Now certainly, this is not to discount the role of the Father. The Father and the Holy Spirit were involved as well. As I told you earlier, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we are told that creation is from the Father, but through the Son. The Father is the ultimate source, but nevertheless it was the Son, Jesus Christ, who was the agent through whom the universe came into being. Now, compare that with the Isaiah 44, 24 passage. Do you see the significance of this? If Jesus is the agent of creation, as the New Testament indicates, and yet only Yahweh can be the creator, put those together, and that indicates that Christ himself is God. He is Yahweh. And you need to be able to demonstrate this fact to the Jehovah's Witness. Jesus is not a lesser God than God the Father. Jesus is just as divine as the Father is, or else he could not be the divine creator. Certainly there is an authority structure within the Trinity with the Father over the Son. 
But nevertheless, the Son is equal to the Father in terms of the divine nature. Now we can also quickly look at uh, Christ as a sustainer. And I'm going to move pretty quickly here. I hope that your hands are, are warmed up. Uh, Christ is also the divine sustainer. You know, back in the book of Exodus, we read that it was Yahweh, or God, who sustained his people during the wilderness experience. Over and over again, Yahweh intervenes to save his people and to sustain his people. Well, what's interesting is that when you get to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4, we are also told that Christ, the spiritual rock, accompanied the people in the wilderness. Christ was involved back in the Exodus. So the greater light of the New Testament helps us to see some things we didn't see before in the Old Testament. And by drawing this connection between the Jesus of the New Testament and the Yahweh of the Old Testament, this is a very powerful argument for the deity of Jesus Christ. The same thing is true of Christ as shepherd. Now back in the Old Testament, who was portrayed as being the shepherd? Yahweh, yes. Yahweh is my shepherd, Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd. And you see this emphasized throughout the rest of Scripture. In fact, Yahweh is said to lead his people beside quiet waters. Well, in the New Testament, it is Christ who is called the Good Shepherd, and his role is described in similar terms. For example, in Revelation 7:17, 7, we read that the Lamb, Christ, at the center of the throne, will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. Now, by approaching the Old Testament with the greater light of the New Testament, we start to see things that we didn't see before. We see a connection between the Jesus of the New Testament and the Yahweh of the Old Testament. And you bring those truths together, and that represents a powerful argument for the deity of Jesus Christ. You need to be able to demonstrate this to your Jehovah's Witness friends. How about Christ as the divine revealer? Christ as the divine revealer. Now, before the prophets in the Old Testament would speak forth some divine oracle, what did they always say? Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith Yahweh. And you see this all throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Now what's interesting to me is that when you get to the New Testament, when you get to 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11, we are told that the Spirit of Christ spoke through the Old Testament prophets. The Spirit of Christ spoke through the Old Testament prophets. Now isn't that interesting? Back in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. In the New Testament, the Spirit of Christ spoke through the prophets. By approaching the Old Testament with the greater light of the New Testament, we see stuff we didn't see before. We see a connection between Jesus of the New Testament and Yahweh of the Old Testament. And I believe that this is a strong argument for the deity of Christ. How about Christ as the God of glory? This is another example. I point you back to Isaiah 6. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is in the temple and he has a vision. And he sees God in all of his glory. Uh, there's uh, seraphim angels hovering around the throne. And these angels are singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. And uh, with two of their wings, they flew. With two of their wings, they covered their feet, indicating humility. But with two of their wings, they covered their eyes. Why? Apparently, the glory of God is so intense, so resplendently glorious, that even they cannot look into the raw glory of God without covering their eyes. Now what's significant is that when you get to the New Testament, in John 12, 41, John 12, 41, we are told specifically that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus Christ. He saw the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, that's very significant. Back in the Old Testament, we see the glory of Yahweh described. And in the New Testament, we see the glory of Jesus. We see that the glory of Jesus and the glory of Yahweh are one and the same. You see what I'm driving at here? This is a powerful indication for the deity of Jesus Christ. And you need to keep in mind what God said about his glory. Will he share his glory with anyone else? No. I will share my glory with no one else, Yahweh says. And yet Christ has the glory of Yahweh. Christ is the God of glory. Uh, the last thing I'm going to point out in this section is that Christ is the divine Savior. Christ is the divine Savior. And the verse I want you to make note of is Isaiah 43.11. Isaiah 43.11. In this passage, Yahweh is again talking, and Yahweh says this, I, even I, am Yahweh, the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. Now burn that into your consciousness. Yahweh says, I am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. 
Now, of course, the reason why that's significant is that when we get to the New Testament, we are told over and over again that Christ himself is Savior. When Christ was born, angels appeared to shepherds and said, Christ the Savior is born in Bethlehem. In Titus 2.13, we read of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you put those two together. Jesus is the Savior in the New Testament. Yahweh is the Savior, the only Savior there is, according to the Old Testament. And it's a strong indication for the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, by using these kinds of arguments, by comparing the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can start to show your Jehovah's Witness friend that Jesus is not a lesser God, but rather Jesus is absolutely divine. Yes, Jesus became a man and he condescended in becoming a man and he took on a lowlier position for a time, but in his divine nature, he is absolutely as divine as the Father himself. And this is one of the things that you'll want to emphasize. Now in my few closing minutes together with you, I would like to shift your attention to a few do's and don'ts of witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. A few do's and don'ts of witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses. And I would like to give credit to my former colleague, Walter Martin. I came to CRI and uh, took a job, and Walter Martin died six months later. I'll never forget that. But during those six months, Walter Martin did have a profound impact on me, and he still speaks through his literature and through his tapes. And some of the points that he made are some of the points I'd like to share with you because I've adopted these points into my own ministry. So if you would, allow me just for a few moments. I'd like to share a few of those with you. The first do is, do identify with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Do identify with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now let them know that you care for them. Let them know that you think that they're a worthwhile person because they are. They're just as worthwhile as you are. You're not better than them. These are people that God loves. And for that reason, you need to treat them with that kind of respect. Jehovah's Witnesses are just like us in that they have families, they have a need for friends, they have frustrations, and they have fears, they have problems they're working through. They get cancer just like everybody else. Let's recognize that these people are human beings and treat them with the respect that goes along with that. If you can keep this in mind, that they are people who like their families and they have children and they have needs that need to be met just like we do, I think that you're going to find it a lot easier to talk with them on a heart-to-heart -heart level. Now, a second do is this. Do labor persistently with the Jehovah's Witness. Do labor persistently with the Jehovah's Witness. Now, I know that some of you, you're watching the ball game and the doorbell rings. And your tendency is just to want to get it over with quickly so you can get back to your ball game. Am I right? That happens a lot. But you need to be able, you need to have a mindset in advance that says, I'm going to spend time when they show up. I want to spend some time and talk with them. And if that means also that you need to meet every two weeks, I think that you should be ready to do that. You need to labor persistently with the Jehovah's Witness. And that uh, you should never give up unless they close the door. You should always be a willing witness for Jesus Christ up until the time that they close the door. And it may be that the Lord Jesus will use you to bring them to the living Christ, which is what it's all about. I wish you could uh, experience the kind of joy that I have in my own life, the kind of joy that I experience when I lead someone to Jesus Christ, the true Savior. There's nothing like it in all the world. You know, nothing like it in all the world. I hope that you can experience that sometime. Now, a third do is this. Do exhaust every effort to answer the questions of the Jehovah's Witness. Do exhaust every effort to answer the questions of Jehovah's Witnesses. As I said, we must not only be able to share what we believe, but why we believe it as well. We need to be aware of the verses, like I've shared with you today, that, help, that can help you establish the deity of Jesus Christ and the fact that Christ is the true Savior. Now, were the apostles involved in apologetics? Did they just preach the gospel or were they also involved in apologetics? They were involved in apologetics. For example, we read that Paul reasoned from the scriptures with the Jews and with the different people that he spoke with. We need to do the same thing. You don't have to have a seminary degree to do it. Now, I tell you, some of you are scared of the fact that they might ask a question or bring up an issue that you cannot answer. And if that happens, you need to do what Walter Martin suggested, and that is all you've got to do is say, 
You know, that's a good question. That's a good point that you bring up. I don't know the answer to it, but let me do some research on it. And I'm going to talk to you about that in the future. Maybe we can get together in two weeks and we can, we can uh, deal with this. Now, the very next day, you need to call Paul Carden at his home phone. Write this down, 451, no. <laughs> there are fine ministries that can help you with questions that you may not be able to answer. Uh, certainly Paul's ministry and Rich's ministry are among those, and certainly my ministry is there for you as well. And by the way, I might mention to you that uh, uh, just like there is an Apologia report that goes out over the Internet, there's also a monthly Reasoning from the Scriptures newsletter that goes out to 32 countries right now with many thousands of subscribers, and it's free for the asking. Uh, if you want that, you can just simply write me at ronrose at aol.com. ronrose at aol.com and put the word subscribe in there. And we can send you all the back issues as well. So if that would be helpful to you, then, then please don't hesitate. The fourth do is this. Do allow the Jehovah's Witness to save face. Do allow him or her to save face. Don't talk down to the Jehovah's Witness. They are just as worthy before God as you are. And when you share the gospel with a Jehovah's Witness and defend your position from Scripture, it's feasible that there might come a point when you might sense in your heart that you've won the argument. Now that won't always be the case. Sometimes you might feel like you've lost an argument. But if you sense that you've won the argument, that's the time to be magnanimous. That's the time to reach out and to help them. Give them the true Savior, Jesus Christ. If you disarm it that way, and instead of putting a barrier between you and the Jehovah's Witness, you can build a bridge to the Jehovah's Witness. Again, that compassion and that loving spirit means everything. When a Jehovah's Witness walks away from my doorstep, I want them to know one thing. Even if they disagree with my theology, I want them to walk away saying, you know, that was a nice guy. I'd like to make friends with that guy. That's what I would like to see happen. Now quickly, I've got two minutes. There are two don'ts. There are two don'ts. First of all, don't approach the Jehovah's Witness with a spiritual chip on your shoulder. A spiritual chip is the communication or the feeling that you're looking down on them. It's like, you're lucky that you came to my house today so I can set you straight. That's a spiritual chip on your shoulder. There's no room for pride in the work of apologetics. Friends, I told you earlier that Christianity is more than having the right answer. There's a relationship with Christ that is involved. Apologetics is more than having the right answer. There's a relationship with Christ that should permeate everything that you do, including your attitude and how you treat other people. Now, I learned through years of hard experience the importance of this. I used to use what I call the flamethrower approach in witnessing. That's where somebody shows up and you get out this flamethrower and just roast them doctrinally. You don't win anybody to Christ in that way. But you do win them to Christ that you've got a loving heart where you can reach out to them and share some of these scriptural points that I've given you today. And one final point. The second do is, don't is don't lose your patience. Don't lose your patience. If you should lose your patience and raise your voice, you've lost. You've lost. You're going to be tempted to raise your voice and to get mad, but don't do it. Trust in God. Every time you witness, trust in God to give you the strength to be patient. 